Hey everybody, my name is James Gopp. I'm a cook by trade, a fire master by profession, and a scientist by curiosity. And I love to enrich the lives of others around me through fire-based food experiences. And I am Simeon Mordecai Bittman of Simeon Food Nature, chef extraordinaire, all around good guy, dad, outdoorsman, adventurous type. And this is Figuratively, Figuratively Feasting. Feasting. All right, fantastic, man. How you doing tonight? You know, I'm all right. Yeah, you look all right. You look comfortable. Yeah, Apparently, comfortable, huh? Yeah, it's, it's uh, Casual yes. Tuesdays. Yes. I missed the memo on that, everybody. <laughs> I hope you got it at least, so I didn't come overdress the occasion. Yeah. But, I mean, I thought our agreement was, I was the, uh, I mean, I guess it's fine, because I was the handsome guy that was going to sell the show, and you were going to have the intellectual type of stuff, but based off of the conversation you and I had afterwards, we got to work on that this week. <laughs> so, like, apparently <laughs> neither. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. It's a sleepover night tonight, guys. So Yeah, yeah. It's but, been a long week. Yeah. Let me just say that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we're getting through. We're That's, getting by. Okay. All Tough right. times. Tough times, but... That corona. Yes, that corona life. But on the bright side, I'm super excited, man. I feel great yeah, tonight. Yeah, me too, man. Because this is going to be a good night. Yeah. We, tonight we get to talk about something we both deeply love, and that's open fire cooking. Absolutely. So, I mean... We're going to kind of go all over the place here a little bit, but we're going to talk about some of the colonial era cooking, cooking instruments that they might have used at that point, what was going on in the Americas, what was going around all over the world. I just can't wait to get into it. So Yeah, and I'm just going to talk about how wild it was, man. So wild. So wild. Yeah. Fire, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just totally changed humans. It did. So let's, I mean, that's the interesting thing about all this is that it's so easy to forget the past of how we got here today. So I think it only makes sense to talk about a brief history of humanity and how when we started to cook over fire, that's truly when we became human. No other species cooks for themselves. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Just take a moment to think about that. No other species cooks for themselves. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it's totally freaking nuts. It's like for us to be able to consider that now as adults and from it being drilled into our heads in science books as we were kids, mm -hmm. it always felt like it was such dry, boring materials. Like, great, Homo erectus, first fire, 1.4 million years ago. But yo, first fire, Homo erectus was 1.4 million years ago. That's, yeah, that's insane. Crazy. It's insane. It's insane. And to think how much, I mean, it's so crazy, but it, because also like, how did that first happen? Seriously. It's not like somebody was like, Hey, you know what? Um, let's just make a fire and, and, you know, throw on some charcoal and put a steak on the was fire. Was it lightning? Like what? Was yeah. it just an accident? Like a spark from two pieces of flint rock or like flint stone or something? Yeah. Or, I mean, there's so many different theories where it could have been a storm, like a lightning that maybe struck a tree or something like that. And somehow... What? I mean, maybe it was a chili like, nut. oh, I want to cook my meat on it. Yeah, like, maybe. Ksh. Or maybe they just happened to shoot a deer or a boar or something, and they're like, oh, wow, it's kind of a chilly night, kind of like the nights are now. And hey, well, maybe let's, let's get around this fire. Okay, wow, let's maybe throw some more branches on it so we continue to stay warm. Okay, what happens if, I mean, what was that? I mean, like, could you imagine to have just witnessed that? I mean, that forever changed humanity. Someone just taking, ugh. <laughs> Ooh, you know the smell i mean we all love that smell I love right how you make them out to be these like barbaric well they were you know? weren't they i mean at I that mean, point in time think about how small their brains were like fused with nature so much more than us probably like they were closer Simpler. to all animals and the yeah. rest of life more connected to it just the feeling now i can't help but think about you know when we sit around the campfire that sense of comfort that we have yeah that is deeply deeply ingrained in our dna mm. and i can't help but think that that probably stems from a point in time where we see a fire, yeah. we feel warmth, we feel comfort because there's a level there that means we're going to eat. And we're not going to die today. Like it's the middle of some really cold season. We just barely have enough clothing or whatever the hell yeah. we have to keep ourselves warm. Right. There aren't, there isn't like a home that we go to. Exactly. There's nothing like that. And this fire now means that we will survive. That feeling of nourishment, um, 
something special. Yeah. And then also, you know, briefly going over how we evolved as human beings. Homo erectus, it was, uh, you know, there's so many. No one was alive back then. You could only go off of fossils or different things found around the world. But the prevailing theory was Homo erectus was the very first species, the hominin, to leave Africa and be able to travel around. Now, according to the bones and things that Homo erectus had smaller teeth, yep. larger brain, yeah. and more of a muscular physique. Right. So that would, through the theories, make one believe that they didn't have larger teeth to grind up raw grains, that they mainly consumed a more animal-heavy diet. Yeah. Now, right. when it comes to, this is something we've talked about a lot, when it comes to processing meat, especially mm. if it's raw, you got to think about back then. They probably had some flint tools, some kind of sharp rocks. They had no idea. They didn't have those beautiful Japanese knives or, yeah, right. you know, Elmac steel or whatever. You know, it's, it's all these crude utensils to be able to cut the meat. So those big pieces are thrown in their mouth, having just to chew all day. And, <laughs> you know, think about the energy it takes to just chew that, yeah, right? Like and then even just like a raw vegetable too, chewing that up. When you consume it into your body, it takes more energy to break it down. And Not it, to mention yeah. all of the vitamins and essential minerals and things might not be as bioavailable right. as they could be when something is a little bit, when something is cooked, broken down a little bit more. Right, Still exactly. So the theories prevail. There are theories in the other way, obviously, and there's science in the other direction too. But sure, sure. this all could have contributed to the evolution and the intelligence of the Homo erectus to even come up with the idea to go on a journey to another land, to be yeah. like, oh, cool, well, I got fire, to actually put that all together in their head. Yeah, exactly. That's like definitely must have been the first species on the planet to put together a complex idea like that's that. That's the idea. Yeah. Execute it and yeah. have it create so much change. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. They found uh, bones like over to Asia, to India. It's pretty incredible. The prevailing idea here is that by cooking food, it kind of part Partially digests it, and I know that doesn't sound very attractive or delicious, sounds but it's a, awesome. Sounds so you just love eating like half so chewed good. up, like find that piece of bubble gum under the table in school and pop so it in your mouth. Like all right, thing. there's still some life in here. There's a little fruit. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so the the idea with you by half digesting, it's easier for your body to break it down. Yeah. And back then, like when every single calorie counts based off of survival or dying, you need all those calories. If it doesn't take a lot of energy to break that food down, you're left with some calories, therefore mm -hmm. causing your brain to grow and maybe having other, you know, more muscles growing on your frame. So development uh, of the cerebral cortex. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty pretty astounding stuff. The mm. brain needs a lot of calories. So Simeon didn't eat that much today. I, but, um, <laughs> what did you say? Uh yeah. Uh, Exactly. So, yeah, so it's pretty wild. Outside of the fact of, you know, actually cooking it and then it preserving uh, calories for your body to evolve, you also got to think about back then they had no clue about foodborne illnesses, pathogens, toxins, and vegetables. So by cooking these proteins, you're searing on the outside and probably in their case cooking all the way through. So even if the meat was sitting out, obviously unrefrigerated, uh, especially if it's in the summertime for a few days, cooking it well done. They might get some level of upset stomach, but you're killing a lot of the bacteria. And also, you know, some things like we were talking about eating potatoes. You eat a ton of potatoes, you're going to get a stomach ache, and that's because there's a lot of toxins in the potatoes that are going to make you sick. Solenoids, yeah, exactly. Like when, you're, when your potatoes turn green, it sort of just concentrates yeah. those compounds. Yeah, there at least must have been a severe learning curve for people's bodies back then. Oh, my then. God, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, bodies adapt, I'm sure. Like when you go travel to another part of the world, you get sick as hell sometimes sure. on some food. Sure, and, and water, everybody too. else eats the same shit all the time, and they're just adjusted. You know, it's almost like it's like a trial by fire, some people say. When yeah. you go to certain parts of the world, like you want to eat that food, get ready to be sick as hell for like three yeah. days, and then you'll be good. Yeah, down in Mexico, I think when you drink or you drink any water or eat something that was cooked with water, they call it Montezuma's Revenge. Yeah, right. That's right. like the, the thing that's always <laughs> told you in school. Yeah. But also another quick side note that we can discuss at a different time is think about all of the food that we're eating today. You hear these like, you know, uh, gluten sensitivities, artificial ingredients that are in our food right now. Yeah. Like how is our bodies evolving? How are they evolving right now? Yeah. And what is it going to look like 10 years from now? Yeah, they're like evolving unnaturally. Because now they are all safe, all of those products. 
They are like safe from those pathogens and all those things that were living in the meat right. way back when, before fires were figured out. It's definitely free of that, and I guess I guess that's good for sure. But there's also, you know, what do you think about? Ugh, quick side note again about yeah. charcuterie, right? Yeah, yeah. So charcuterie is a big thing. Well, this you know? is cool. We'll get into this anyway. Yeah, we'll get into this later. But just as a brief side note, we're thinking about charcuterie, pathogens, things like this. Way back in the day, you hear about all these Italian grandfathers and uncles making these big, beautiful soppressata salamis or Genoa salamis in their basements. Or even you go back to like France, they're curing things inside of caves. Yeah. Cheese is inside of caves. Totally. Right? And obviously, it takes a few bad mistakes where people can get violently sick because people are not following the correct you know, uh, hygiene requirements or you know, paying attention to temperature, all these types of things, and people get sick, then the regulations come down on it. And it's so strange because now we're in an area, thankfully, in the Berkshires. It's not New York City. It's not Boston where no. you know, we have a HACCP plan. We follow everything to the T. We record everything we make from where the product comes from, the whole process. But there's a lot of folks that don't do that. And if you're in the city and you didn't have that stuff, you know, some places require a state inspection. Yeah. It means you got to have a state inspector come out, someone from the uh, USDA inspecting yeah. this area, total clean room. Yeah. It's got to be sterile as hell. Yeah. So, like, all of the fine, funky nuances that you would be achieving from a cave or the bacteria that's living yeah. inside of, like, say, for instance, my charcuterie cabinet, yeah. you're eradicating all yeah. that. Yeah, and not to mention you're just forgetting what instincts you might be able to connect to that have nothing to do with looking at temperature gauges, yes. humidity, and all that, but just being able to look at a piece of meat hanging and like smell it, check it out, squeeze right. it, touch it, and be like, that's gonna make me sick as hell. Like, yeah. I'm not gonna eat that. Exactly, no, because you're so concerned about all, like how sterile is it? Is the stainless steel, can you see yourself in it? Yeah. And uh, also not to mention like the the nutritional benefits it has to your stomach, you know, the, the benefits it has to your gut flora. You know, so there's a lot of that stuff where people get weirded out about mold, but we'll get into that in, at, a yeah, yeah. at a different point in time. Yeah, totally. But, uh, yeah, just going back to this idea of, you know, these hominids just traveling all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then thinking about leaving that cradle in Africa and traveling around and being able to harness fire, knowing how to use it, carrying with you tinder or tree sap or, you know, some of this, uh, this, this ice man they found. I think it was yeah. in Norway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, a tree, a tree mushroom, a tree fungus, which is kind of like a polypore mushroom. Yeah. If you look up, say, online, like a birch polypore mushroom, you'll yeah. see it dried out. You Things can... are like freaking rocks. They're yeah. like stones. Yeah. Yeah. They're Perfect like stones. For... Totally. It's like a piece of wood, yeah. really. So it's absolutely crazy how that all happened. And, and that's perfect for starting fire. So it was used, the polypore would be used as like a, a lighting, like to create spark to build fire. Is that right? So the research I saw was that they would use it as tinder. They would shred that. Like, oh. it, was, like it was wood. Wow, like, like kindling. Exactly, yeah. Some kind of, you know, like how you have your flint, you spark it, and you bake a nice little pile of uh, tinder, yeah. and you spark the flint into it, and it catches it, and it, you know, goes out, you know, catches yeah. on fire. They make something now called char cloth. Um, you familiar with that? No. It's cool. It's, you just basically take like a piece of cotton fabric, and you uh. carbonize it. You put it inside of a container, get it really, really hot till it turns essentially to carbon. You rip a small piece of that, put that down, and when you ignite it, when you catch it with a flint spark, it acts like it's that's a perfect crazy. tinder. And uh, that's so... That just goes to show how we've evolved Insane. to be able to create these things yeah, that, that make starting a fire so simple. I wonder if all that time ago, there were certain people who had the ability, the skill to start a fire, which actually, you know, it takes some ability. It takes yep. some skill. It takes some understanding yeah. of how it all works and what's going to happen. In order, like with with oxygen flow, yes, and with understanding the right type of wood that lights and what doesn't, yeah, and, and knowing you gotta have the dry it, stuff so the that dry you're not, stuff, and you, you don't start with giant logs either. You right. start with like tiny little pieces, and you build your way up. And now having when, this the stuff on you, because imagine if you're in the middle of the woods, you're thinking like, well, shit, any any branch, any. All I need to go out is collect branches, but what happens if all the branches you have are on the ground? Yeah, and it's wet, and you can't get it going. That dude, that literally means. You're gonna die. You're gonna die, You're dude. gonna die, yeah. It's <laughs> insane. And so many people, humans, uh, homo erectuses, whatever, you know, they all, I'm sure tons of people died along their way. Yeah. And here we and are. People got sick too, I so bet. So sick, dude. So sick. Eating mushrooms, eating 
product that's past its shelf date so <laughs> much, man. Shelf date. Yeah, and then just the whole evolution as uh, you know, as a species. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty intense. I mean, a big focus of what we do at Heirloom Fire is kind of looking at a lot of colonial techniques, to kind of looking at different spit jacks. And yeah, and this is a cool area for us to just stay in if we can this that particular time frame because you know we could go back 1.4 million years sure and try to trace the path and both of us have been really looking into that i feel like the last couple of weeks just researching and getting excited but yeah. that time in particular which was like 1500 to 1800 yeah um and worldwide for sure uh but what you're definitely into is europe uh, and what was happening there developments in yeah. implements mm -hmm. and cooking, cooking yeah. style and everything. Yeah, for sure. And the other incredibly uh, interesting thing, I think, is that we were talking about this off camera, and this will be a whole other topic, I think, because this, you know, the colonial era has so much rich information and technology and cool things to talk about. Yeah, and also, but, like, amazing that they recorded all that stuff. They were able to keep it, and they were able to record it. There were their drawings... Yeah. There are diagrams. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Things yeah, yeah. documented, journal entries and shit. You know, back in Europe, uh, they were really serious about gardening. They understood soil fertility. They really cared about weeding and collecting seeds. When the people revolted against England, the, the colonists, they would refer to them as savages in the sense that they didn't really give, they, they didn't really care about what was going on. They didn't pay attention. They were sort of like uneducated uh -huh. people going out and uh, starting stuff because these people didn't come from prestigious, wealthy backgrounds. These were people that were just common workers who maybe didn't have that education. They weren't around it, but they knew they had to grow their own crops and maybe they had an idea. Oh, that's interesting. So is no that idea. why when they came to the New World, as the story goes, they had no idea what they were doing yeah. with gardening and all this stuff, and they exactly. totally needed help? Exactly. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and that's hmm. where... It, it's just crazy. Some of those old houses, too, unrelated to the topic of growing food, but a lot of them, when they very first built their houses there was no floors. It was dirt. And so everybody just slept. It was basically a one room house. You were lucky to have, like if you had a floor, it's, in, it's insane. Huh. So, I mean, one of the trips I took, uh, last, I guess in November last year was heading over to Scotland. And I was really taken with a place called Stirling Castle. A lot of those old castles out there, they're still basically working museums. You can go wow. around, there's a lot of things. You can check out all the turrets the, where they kept their wow. cannons and stuff. Did you get an idea of when that castle was erected? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I can't remember huh. at this point in time, but um, I want to like, say it was like the 1800s or maybe even... No, no, it would have been like the 1700s yeah, or so. Yeah, right. Maybe even a little earlier. So in that right. era, so in the colonial era. Yeah, exactly. Scotland. And, and you went down to the kitchen and the stuff? The kitchen, yeah. So that was the most exciting part of it huh. was they actually had like life-size reproductions of people, somebody, you know, working in the bread oven. It was this massive hearth on the ground, like a big beehive hearth. And they were putting the breads in there, you know, they build the fire in the back, so had like these nice like red LEDs or light bulbs in the back. Oh yeah, that's cool. I think I remember you posting that. And they, did they have the sounds? They were showing yes. that they were playing the sounds of yes. the people in the kitchen, like exactly. clanging of things and yes. all that. That background noise, it was so cool, man. Yeah. It was like, you know, the Epcot Center for Chefs and Cooks. It was <laughs> so cool. Yeah. So I remember because also too, back then folks were smaller uh, you know yeah. I would probably would have been a giant back then but uh, well, both <laughs> of us would have been because we're both quite tall yeah and uh and very handsome one of us yeah so the Me. yeah exactly <laughs> even so, when I'm all disheveled like this we'll have to take a poll Leave a comment, please. So, um, the <laughs> so anyway, yeah, sorry. No, no, no problem, no problem. I know you need as much attention as you can get. I do need a lot of attention. A lot of attention, a lot of acceptance. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was heading back uh, to go into the other areas, taking pictures, and I walked and I smashed my face <laughs> so hard on this arch that yeah. I actually, I thought I broke my nose, man. I had like <laughs> tears in my eyes. Were there eyes. people around and shit? No, thankfully there wasn't. That would have been... 
I don't know. Actually, this, you know, at this point in time, I don't even care anymore. I'm just at the <laughs> stage where I'm like, whatever, dude. Yeah, <laughs> I smashed my nose. It was fine. Like, I de- it definitely rocked me a little bit for sure. But, um, you know, got there, you see like a, somebody holding the fish, like they're going to butcher it. And then they had this <laughs> massive hearth in the back where they had somebody. So it was like round like that. Yes. And maybe it was bricks exactly around. Exactly right. Yeah. Just like all the arches were bricks, kind of like how you would see in any sort of earthen oven or old brick archway or even some bridges, you'll see them like that. The bricks are sort of, sort of stacked on an arch. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so it was probably, I would say, man, probably 15 feet wide. Wow. And so they, again, they had like a younger person in there, like a mannequin yeah. turning a pig. So with rad. A moniker, or with a, like a small um, miniature fire or a fake fire. Yeah. But so it's so funny because back then they were called a spit boy or a spit jack. Huh. So the term Jack came from like young lad. Oh wow! And then it just sort of progressed through which to is, become a Jack, which yeah. is like a spit or a spit Jack, which spit. is an implement. Exactly correct. <clears throat> a cooking yeah. implement that and slowly turns meat. They, and there's all different kinds. So it kind of it started with somebody turning the meat, usually a child, someone young that had nothing else to do or that had lower value as far as the. Uh, you you know, know who I just thought of, right? I don't want to name any names, but. Well, go ahead now because you're going to have to tell me. No, I can't. I think I know. You know exactly who. We'll talk off camera. Yeah. And uh, anyway, well, maybe we'll we, tell you someday. Yeah. So, as you know, um, I've worked for Heirloom Fire for almost for four years uh, mm-hmm. on and off at events. And there have been many spit boys. There certainly have. Turning yeah. the old meat before, yeah. actually, before the advent of the clockwork spitjack. Yes. Which yeah. was something that James researched, got really excited about, and found somebody to build for him. Yeah, and that was a huge, huge... Like, it took a lot of inspiration off of an old design, but making it capable to be transportable and also to yeah, spin of. something a little bit... Yeah, it takes right. like five of us to freaking lift the thing yeah. out of the truck and get it down. So heavy. Yeah, and but that's not even the heaviest piece of equipment. It's that ice chest, oh my which God. is the silliest the thing. Chest. But the ice chest is the heaviest, pe- heaviest and most dangerous piece of equipment <laughs> I, I own. Very strange. I mean, I think at the end of the day, while we decided to move away from that, because it was very minimal, I mean, it's really just a, a handle you put on a pole with a piece of protein at these events where you would turn over the fire. And you can't leave. You, no, you cannot can't. leave the spit. No, you For can't. a second, because the meat will get yeah. uh, cook. It'll cook unevenly, and you'll end up with burn patches. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I was always, te- you know, I'd always tell people that you yeah. have a tremendous. You like try to go get a drink of water or something. You walk away for like thirty seconds, and I don't know where James comes from, but he yeah. comes out of nowhere, and he's like, ah. Uh, Nobody's watching the meat. Yeah, exactly. Just Hello? sitting there and the fat is rendering Hello? and it's dripping into the fire. Yeah, and it burns. And the problem about that is that at the end of the day, an animal gave its life. So people would used to come up to me and say, you know, they make electric motors for this, right? And I'd say, yeah, they do. But this animal had a life and this is a celebration of its life. And we're going to turn, you know, we're going to slowly turn it and give it the respect and the show that it that it deserves. Yeah, I love that, man. You got to suffer for stuff. You, you have gotta to. You got to suffer when something gives its life for you. That's oh. pretty big. I mean, maybe suffer is not exactly the right word, but it's like, yeah, it you've got to be willing to go through, you yourself, I mean, have to suffer. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But like, you not maybe not suffer, but you have to be willing to go through some shit to make, to, to respect the fact. Yeah, the fact that you could survive another day. Yeah. You know, and that's the part where so many folks take that for granted, right? Where it's like, we don't have to worry because we have a roof over our heads. It's like we're talking about the very beginning of civilization. Yeah. It's easy to take what we have now for granted. Yeah. And when me, I have been part, uh, I've been a part of many on farm slaughters, and it's a. Yeah. It's a really serious experience. <clears throat> and definitely to get okay with that is challenging, but also to pay full respect. Yeah. You know, the very first time I was a part of that, I made sure at that point in time, I made an active decision in my mind that I would never waste a single ounce of any animal product. I mean, I raised three pigs, and that was from piglet to slaughter. I do want to discuss a podcast about what it means to eat meat, and that's something we'll talk about. But I will just say now that it was one of the most challenging things I ever had to do. And as I ate portions, whether it be a pork chop or a ham or whatever, a roast from those pigs, 
every time there was a little prayer said and there was a bit of emotion that took you yeah. over. So you don't screw around with that. I mean, I take no, that man. seriously now. And that's where I feel like every single person needs to have a garden at their house so they understand what it takes to produce one tomato. Yeah. You know, everything. So you don't waste anything. You know, you go to the grocery store, you can buy these things. You buy tomatoes 365 days a yeah. year. And you shouldn't be able to. No, it's true. You shouldn't. You know, it's not good yep. for the earth. It's not, it doesn't even, it doesn't even taste good. And it's really honestly not even that good for you because it's so lacking in nutrition. Yeah. So anyhow, I'm, I'm getting on a tear, as you can see. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm yank me off my soapbox. Yeah, I know. Totally. Because I'm ready to get, jump in there too, man. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, it shouldn't be... Yeah, anyway. All right. Go yeah. on. Please, continue. Continue. Well, going back to... I don't even know what we were talking about. We were probably, t oh, we're talking about spit jabs. Yeah, we were. And then the responsibility of when you're roasting something, you have to take that seriously. You've got to pay attention to it. That is a tremendously important job. So all there was was a crank oh, and somebody sitting there in the smoke, in yeah. the heat, yes. slowly winding and away. And depending, if it was a leg of beef, it would be six hours somebody would be. And a leg of beef up. sometimes is not very light. Mm -mm. It's hundreds of pounds. Yeah, and or, you've got this crank yeah. and it's like this. Or even, woom. Woo. Woom, woom. <laughs> you know, like a pig or a lamb could be much more yeah, easily level. too, yeah. So when you come back up and around, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, big, yeah. And then you got to hold it because it wants to pull you <laughs> forward. Yeah. There's a lot of challenge with that. But ultimately, the reason we decided to do that was to, to sort of transition out of that. It had to be a specific reason. It had to be something that was going to be equally as impressive or still had to have some human interaction to it. But we'll get to that in a and second. And had to make it easier, you know, because yeah. uh, we're lazy. Yeah, that's what it's all about here. The, whatever We're just we lazy. Can do, is least amount of work we can do. That's how better. we've evolved as a species yeah. because we just we're lazy, so we tried to figure out how to make things easier. Yeah, and I think you know, if anything, you'll take out of this podcast here is you'll also see how perfectly <laughs> Simeon embodies that statement <laughs> with his outfit today. I'm just gonna take a nap and uh, yeah, I'll, be I'll back wake in you a up. Couple minutes. I'll wake yeah, you would up. You, would you mind? Yeah, no problem. Please go I on. This, so just carry <laughs> this whole thing, <laughs> yeah. through, the whole rest of the way. No problem. That's what I do anyway. So the it's true. Uh, no, stop. No, I'm kidding. You don't. We both work very hard. We do. We very We're a good yes. partnership. We are. The two no, of seriously. Us. Yeah, it's good. The progression through these things started off with someone turning, and then it sort of transitioned into situations where there was uh, something they called a dangle jack, which was basically uh, almost like a, a piece that would hang on the hearth that would have these hooks where the meat would connect to there, and every so often you had, you'd have to turn it. It was really interesting. And then there was something else called a clockwork spit jack. Now, this was generally reserved for uh, more wealthy people because it attached and it was this beautiful beautiful yeah. piece of machine that's an interesting twist to all of it well maybe a twist i don't know but that's an interesting overlay to mm -hmm. all of this this time 1500 to 1800 europe is prosperous and yeah. they have almost stepped out of survival mode and are getting into the finer things of life Mm -hmm. They're getting into the luxuries of life. Yes. And they are putting their attention and their passions into new areas. Yes. So cooking is one of them and the development of these really freaking interesting things. A lot of it had to do with trade. England had so much power over the ocean trade. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people were investing in that. A lot of people had shipping businesses. So mm -hmm. a lot of those types of people decided to take reapings of yeah. their investments or whatever yeah. there, the, the fruits of that, and develop their homes. And a lot of that stuff, the hearths were very important because it was the center of their home. One thing I forgot to mention after the hand turning was the progression of uh, what they called a spit dog. Really interesting. It was a specific breed of dog that they bred to have short, stubby legs and a longer body. And they put them into this basically treadmill. It's kind of twisted in a way. Well, yeah, it's very twisted because it was very hot. And they would sometimes, their hair would become singed by oh the fire. Oh, my God. So this big, probably four-foot treadmill that they would put them, pick them up, put them in. And it was not treated like the dogs, like if you have dogs at home or pets, it wasn't treated like that. It was sort it was of shunned because it had a job. Yeah. And I do have a book up here, this orange book that you might be able to see. It's actually a very heartwarming story about uh, a spit dog. The child in the house falls in love with the spit dog. And the father's like, oh, don't, don't fall in love with that. Here, I'll buy you a dog. Buys them like a nice, fancy, beautiful dog. 
not interested. He wants to love the spit dog, but it's, it's a tool. It's not a, it's not a living thing, essentially. That was the way they were viewed. So that's really interesting. But now they have gone extinct. They no longer exist. It was literally called a spit dog. Yeah. Crazy, so right? So weird. So the uh, clock... But, yeah. Anyways, continue. So the clockwork spit jack would kind of mount... And these hearths, we're not talking about like small. Over, over in Europe, they're not small. They're massive. Again, like, you know, 10, 15 feet wide, especially in these well-to-do mansions. Yeah, the well-to-do ones, right. Because you had many people working there. Yeah. You had all different kinds of stuff going all day long. Yeah. And then in the, in the, commoner's, home, in the commoner's home or whatever, yes. I could imagine them just being like, man, fuck those guys, those kings and shit with all of their fancy equipment. We got our little hearth in the basement, like this. They probably did, mm -hmm. and they had chains dangling from the archways with um, cast iron pots, and just in at all different levels, kind of dangled over mm -hmm. with a fire underneath. Probably crowded. A little very basic spit or something. Yeah, definitely crowded, smoky. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, similar concept. It's interesting. The term, you know, the term bringing home the bacon. Oh, uh, yeah. You know how that's considered to be like, oh, this guy's making good money. Yeah. That all stems from that was like a very desirable cut. Cut, you yeah. Know, back then, the more fat you had on something, the more luscious it was. So huh. if you did well, you could afford bacon and you would smoke it, cure it, smoke it. It's an interesting thing. So with these mm -hmm. clockwork spit jacks, they would be mounted on one end of the hearth. And then there would be a sort of pulley system that goes up with a rope that went all the way over to the other end of the hearth that was connected with either a piece of stone or large pieces of lead. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you'd wind these things up and there'd be a barrel in the center. Now, what I have here is this really cool old spit jack that I had, uh, that I got, it was from France, thank you. So if you can see here, it's absolutely beautiful. These, these panels so fold cool. down in the side. And they fold up. I like to keep it open so you can see all the intricate detail on the inside, all these beautiful brass gears. Now, I'm not going to crank it up because it's incredibly annoying. It has, once it gets low, oh, there's, a bell, yeah. there's a bell inside that alerts you. So if you're in the house doing something else, you're tink, tink, tink. Well, now it's time to wind it back up. So this chamber right that here. That should this, be how the podcast ends or some, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, okay, we got to go. But no ding. one, yeah. Dude, I remember working down in the, in the kitchen. Uh, yeah. for heirloom like yeah. during prep times and after that thing had been wound up it would be like four or five days later it would be late at night we'd be finishing up the, <laughs> like, the work at the end of the night it's so it's bad it's like before an event yeah. here, it's, everything's quiet we're just about to go for the end of the night and it's yeah. like ting yeah and it echoes Damn. for sure yeah yeah so it's crazy so inside of this barrel here is a metal coil much like you would have inside of a watch or something like that an old crank up watch and what happens is, as it, you have these gears here that allow it to slowly release its energy up through here. So as it slowly releases it, uh, underneath here you can't see, there's a pendulum that swings around, kind of like a, uh, a grandfather clock. It releases the excess energy because the gears, with their teeth, they're very specifically geared to control the speed. So you have all these gears that come through. That's actually, someone else added that on here. The, the actual thing is in here. Um, but so what would happen is you would hook this up, uh, spit rod, and maybe it's a leg of lamb or a rabbit or a chicken. It would then go all the way across your hearth, and there's another little tined piece that the rod would sit in, and this would slowly turn your piece of protein over the fire. So this is a smaller kind of device. Was it used for smaller things, Cornish hens? Cornish hens, chickens, maybe legs of lamb, rabbits, mm. uh, that type of thing. Um, but, you know, I've tried to actually use this and convert this into turning things. The problem is all of our gear is so heavy, so this doesn't work. But it's beautiful, and I love having it, the history. Yeah. I mean, just to think about what this, what its life was. Mm. I mean, clearly somebody put a you know paint of this sort of beige enamel on it, which is... Yeah. Not awesome, but then I have another one over there so you can actually hear it. It's a beautiful piece, uh -huh. certainly beautiful, and I love the yeah. mechanics of things. Yeah, it's interesting. These really sophisticated things were being developed in that part of the world. And at the same time, in other parts of the world, uh, Native Americans, South America, there were developments taking place and in a lot of ways achieving the same final end, which mm. is deliciously cooked, slowly cooked, and slowly smoked food, but it would be, you know, over an open fire. Yeah. So in Barbados has been uh, considered the home of Bar BQ. Yeah, right. Um, Interesting. They were developing 
very crude, I guess you could consider them crude, but actually quite ingenious implements for cooking. There would be live sticks uh, as stilts of sorts uh, that would be what? over a fire, um, branches, trees. Probably like green wood. Green wood, that's what I mean to say. Yeah. Sure, sure, okay. Green right. wood, yeah. right. Little because it doesn't burn away so quickly. Right, exactly. The moisture, right. That's smart. It's really smart. Propped up. Yep. And then, like, you know, there might be a, a, a V that naturally occurred mm -hmm. in a branch that was at the top. Yep. And then another stick, another green branch that would come across and rest on there. And then meat would be dangled from that. Yeah. And it would be fish in a lot of cases. Sure. Because yeah. it was so, cl they were so abundant. close to the ocean. Yeah. yeah. So abundant. Oh, and they man. figured out these ways of, like, slowly cooking, slowly smoking. Yeah. And it would be this thing. These guys would just be set off guys, women, people set off to be the ones to prepare the food for everybody. Yeah. And they would get at it. And it would take days because it was just slow and low. Oh, it just, it's seriously making my mouth water. Yeah. It's so, so delicious. Good. Yeah. And just like, you know, I'm so happy to be able to have heirloom fire and your love of cooking with fire, how that all resonates with us on a deep level. Deep level. That's it's exactly what I was level. thinking it's when you said that, man. just community and love. It's something that brings everybody together across the world. It's yeah. really, it's an amazing thing. And also like, I also really appreciate the Latin culture and how they are, you know, so many stories when I've, when I've been researching uh, the art of fire cooking, it's like these, a lot of workers, laborers down in, you know, specifically like South America on their lunch breaks, they'll pack a cinder block, set that down, start a fire in there and have some pretty crude like rebar or something like that, some sort of gridiron and be cooking steaks. I mean, that, that they yeah. go to that effort to yeah. cook their lunch. It's yeah, that. Some, some of them, they'll carry these uh, little, they're basically skillets comals yep. and bust out like a couple couple bricks a couple of stones yeah. or whatever start a fire in the middle of it get the comal on top of it and be making fresh tortillas like yeah. right there isn't that beautiful i mean it's not like you know you're not going to the gas station or going down to your local subway down there they're actually taking the time to prepare yeah a meal and barbacoa yeah like that term barbacoa or barbecue uh, still exists in Mexico. It was very much adapted. So it, it adapted from those green sticks and hanging over the fire. Mm. Uh, it went up into Mexico and it was embraced. And sure. it still happens to this day. There's another method of barbacoa is like, then another thing that was going on in other parts of the world at this time is like digging a giant hole, dude, and throwing yeah. coals down Which into is so it. So strange, yeah. And then just Would like think that. wrapping meat in leaves. Yeah. In the case of barbacoa, barbacoa, barb, barba means beard which uh, denotes the fuzziness of fig leaves that were used in wrapping up the meat that would often be buried in the ground covered with more leaves. Yeah. And then yeah, like and hot stones. Yeah. buried and left to just cook for a day. So yeah, I mean that's that's also amazing too that we were talking about is using your ingredients around you to be able to develop your culture. Whether yeah. it's in this case cooking with fire. I remember it's a couple of years ago or something over in I want to say uh, and I might be wrong here, China, they had a bunch of scaffolding that was mm. made with bamboo. People were so like, "Oh my god, that's so unsafe. It's not OSHA approved." I'm sure it's not OSHA approved, but yeah. also, you know, there was a discussion on NPR about how this is how civilizations work. You have an <laughs> abundance of bamboo, you're going to use it, and they've been using it for hundreds of years, yeah. so they know how to use it. It may look uncomfortable for you, but that doesn't mean anything, mm. you know? So I just want to finish up just a, a couple yeah. other few things about these jacks here. Yeah, going back over to Europe. Yeah, going back to Europe, but you know, just a few other things, like a, a bottle jack, which if you go online, you can find them still around. A lot of them, the mechanisms don't work, but basically they took this massive contraption of all these gears and were able to simplify it and put it inside of this brass, it looked like a bottle. It's like a sort of cylinder with a, with a lip that, or rather a stem that would go on top. You'd hang that wow. from a hook hmm. and you would wind that up with a key. And what <laughs> it would do is it would spin vertically a piece of protein from there. But again, it would be something small like a chicken or a, yeah. you know, a, a Cornish game hen or something so like wild, that. It's so wild, man. Yeah. So a lot of this stuff was uh, inspired by Da Vinci and some of the ideas that he had. Yeah, so it's Holy really systems and yeah, he was pretty brilliant. And the you, worm, 
The worm gear. Worm gear. Yeah, and he also created the idea of the modern ball bearing also. So if you guys ever have an opportunity where if there's an exhibit, a Da Vinci exhibit yeah. around in a ma- museum, did you go to that one at the Berkshire yeah, Museum? Did. It's Absolutely. insane. You see the tank yeah. that he created? It's insane. <laughs> but there was a flaw where the wheels could only go one direction. So oh, they think really? because he did not he wasn't an advocate for war that he intentionally designed it that way. Nice. So it would be not Hell. functional like the way you would need it. I love that. Pretty smart. Kind of yeah. like the dude who made the Death Star with the with the trench run there. Nerds out there, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know the one exactly flaw. what you're talking about. So on the topic of Da Vinci, it's interesting. I saw a sketch of his. He created something called a smoke jack that I've never mm. seen any practical examples of. But in theory, it's a brilliant design. So yeah. basically how this would be is that there'd be a chimney. And there'd be a big oversized fan inside of the chimney. Yeah. Now with the way the heat would come up, yeah. heat has a bit of an energy like to a it. convection oven or something. Yeah, and what yeah. it would do is it would force the fan to turn, which then would have the rod that comes down, there's a pinion gear there that would change directions and then be attached to a pulley that would go down, thin the protein. Wow, but that's get, insane. To think about like that. Like that takes an insane person just so, to think of that way back then. Yeah, so we actually tried to develop something like that for one of our uh, one of our cooking apparatuses. It was at, actually into the deep. I don't know if you remember that. When we had the chicken rig out on that sort of island, yeah. and Keith was very excited about the fan. Oh, Remember that? Oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, it's going to work. The heat's going to rise and it's going to turn. The long and the short is it didn't work. I think for many different reasons, just because, you know, the way that the gears. So on top of our chicken rig, how we have it set up is that every, uh, there's four sides to it. And on each side, there's three gears with a long chain that kind of runs. So the idea is that now we have it set up to a leg that has a gear. So you can have this oversized flywheel that we can hand crank. And as we hand crank it, it changes directions in the top and the chain spins all of the chickens or fish or whatever we're deciding to rotate at the same time. If you just understood that, you're awesome you're doing all right so far you're doing yeah, we, good. Don't, we don't want to you we don't think wanna... like james <laughs> you definitely do well you got to see the the clockwork spit jack i mean that's probably the my most sick. most the thing i'm most proud about yeah I mean, that's just absolutely beautiful i got several concrete balls that are counterweights and you crank it up have you yeah. ever actually cranked it yeah yeah i mean it's it's a cool it's a beautiful thing and it's basically this spit jack here but on a much larger scale and incredibly heavy yeah. Incredibly heavy, so as you know. From there, there were other things, too. <laughs> as we started to get a little further down the road, maybe like the late 1800s, people started to develop steam engines. So steam engines then were, you know, ran off of pressure. I actually bought a steam engine myself. It's, it's tricky because you're working with a lot of pressure there. And if we're worried about somebody turning the protein, am I going to be worried about somebody overloading the fire? Then obviously we have a massive explosion, you know. <laughs> so that was kind of X'd out of the, the thing there. But so, so there were steam-driven spits that were also working there and then of course electric spits you mm. know as they've sort of come down which I'm not a huge fan of yeah. and then you have I mean whatever you know to each his own like life is busy we, we're, as we've talked about in the first podcast yeah. life is life and we ha- we're oversaturated with information and yeah. workflow and everything yeah. and sometimes well things evolve to fit the course of the world yeah. and then you have like you know the Traeger grills which are awesome if you you know want to hang out I mean I've seen all those ads on YouTube where it's yeah. you know it's everything's all temperature controlled and it's all wood fired so you still get all you're supposed to get the best of both yeah. I've never used one right. I don't quite know yeah and so. then you've got like the egg the green egg yeah also I've never that. used that yeah. have you and ever then, messed with that uh, a little bit yeah I actually made some really interesting tea smoked pork belly in a green egg once mm. Um, so, you know, there's still a little bit of technique, there's still a little bit of skill you sure. can apply with those things. Yeah. Uh, the Traeger, that's pretty easy. Yeah, and then you've got the grill. Like, it comes all the way up to modern day. we got the grill with a propane tank hooked up to it. Yeah, or the a folks, little the Weber. electric igniter. Yeah. Yeah, or the Weber, the Did, old charcoal briquettes. Yeah, you know how... I don't think we actually talked about that. We you talked about that very first. You a little bit about this recently. Ver- yeah, just, just briefly, the very first podcast that was our test run. Yeah, yeah. We talked about a little bit more how basically... Uh, test run. Yeah, Henry... <laughs> <laughs> Henry, not a failure, a test run. Yeah, that's of course we're looking at things because how lucky is it that we get to do what we love, right? So we were talking. About we're today. really fortunate to be able to do the things that I'll, we do. I'll send you the clip. Yes, that's an inside <laughs> joke. Maybe if you hang around long enough, I'll explain it to you. Uh, but you know, uh, Ford, Henry Ford, was the one who is basically responsible for charcoal brick hats. An original entrepreneur. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, a, as they call it, a titan of industry. A titan of industry, yeah. so ready I, to destroy the planet. 100%. To create absolutely. coal. Yeah, so that ready was Ready to mine fossil fuels yeah. and release carbon dioxide. Do you into think the he air. knew, though? I mean, I and think begin, he had no Probably idea. not. No. But don't you think when, he, when like, they were igniting it and it was smoky and they were all coughing and shit, and all of the miners who were digging that stuff out were getting black lung and everything? Bringing the thought, canaries like, down, mm. the canaries were dying the canaries yeah you would think right yeah. you would think but it would also sort of be like well fuck it because look what we're coming up with right now it's money like and but else and also yeah definitely money and also the these inventions that were yeah really intriguing and really amazing and could potentially change the world it did change the world 100 percent. you know yeah without him you know I mean, i'm sure we would have the ultimately char- came to some vehicle but he was the one that was sort of at the forefront of that and the charcoal briquette yeah so that all started with uh, in spark notes here is that you know I, I so it was edison it was ford it was i can't remember the first the guy's first name but it was uh firestone this as in firestone tires oh. and um there was a naturalist I think Burroughs, maybe John Burroughs was his name. They used to all go out and have these cookouts, and they would use a gas grill of some kind. And uh, then as Ford was starting to come along and start to get, he needed fenders. He needed a lot of production for his Model T. So he ended up working with uh, someone with the last name of Kingsford at that point, who was Hmm. a real estate agent to buy huge amounts of property for Timberland, to just buy a bunch of wood to be able to produce these things. But there was a ton of byproduct from there, sawdust, branches, things like this. And because Ford was a very smart businessman, What do we do with this byproduct? Yeah, he sees all this waste and he's like, well, we're not going to throw that out. What can we do? Mm. So then they started marketing it as a cheap fuel source, as a oh. briquette, a compressed, based off a design a chemist he learned it from. For a long time, it was, it was not a popular thing until the 50s and 60s, mm. where then the great American thing was to have a barbecue. Then the Webbers, the Weber brothers, were actually a steel manufacturing company or fabricators. And what they were actually making for the U.S. Navy was these big steel round buoys. Mm. And he had this idea to create something that was like uh, a grill just by cutting these buoys in half. Mm. And now, he's a, as I'm saying it, I'm sure you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, that's the classic Weber grill. It's an orb. Ford used to actually boost the interest in these charcoal briquettes. They would create these kits, these barbecue kits, mm. early forms of marketing. Pretty brilliant yeah, stuff. Yeah, pretty smart. And also like sad and weird and reducing all of this amazing history. Yeah. And like, you know, if you, if you look at that and then you look at our starting point today, which was Homo erectus (laughs) and like the first fires being built and society, like human evolution beginning to really take off because of the creation or understanding of the wielding of fire. Yeah. All the way up to fucking what we've done to it now and how it like ran through the filter of marketing and all these inventions and all this stuff. It's all actually quite intriguing in a way. Homo erectus develops possibly some reasoning at that point, frontal cortex, maybe because they could cook and they could eat meat. Then they get these ideas like, let's travel, let's, let's try, let's look at other lands or see other lands or whatever the motivation was I wonder there. what that was. Was it because of there was some conflict maybe with other hominins, yeah. you know, and they're like, you know what, let's get out of here. It's too crowded or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, interrupt Maybe it was just like, yeah, we got fire so we can just roll. Like yeah. we can go anywhere. All we got to do is hunt. Maybe if we can go somewhere further away, we could find new elk or new meat to capture, new right. hunting, right. new grounds. Anyway, um, yeah, and that, that it comes from that ability to invent and come up, to, uh, come up with ideas. And that ability is still being utilized all the way through marketing campaigns. Mm-hmm. Henry Ford developing the engine and all that sort of ingenuity there. But and and all these other inventions that are some that seem to be sad and reductive and pathetic, like marketing strategy of fire and charcoal briquettes and grills and all that. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I mean, there's one of my favorite phrases, and I don't know if I've used this here yet, but you can never light a candle without casting a shadow. Mm. You know, you got to think about you know at that point in time. Not that Henry Ford is the villain. 
But as yeah. they say in movies, you know, the villain never sees himself as the villain. Mm -hmm. You know, so with those types of people, they have an outlook that they're changing the world. And yeah. he did change the world. And yeah. he had an admirable cause. Yeah. Now, ultimately, as a business, capitalism... Right, yeah. how it works is you got to produce more for less. You have to grow every single year. That is what you're taught in business 101. If you're not growing, your business is failing, and that's not always true yeah. because you're putting yourself, especially if you have investors, if you're not seeing signs of increase with your uh, profit and loss yeah. statement, they're not happy. Yeah, and that shouldn't be the case because you're forced to look at things on a level where you got to make cuts here and here and there and everything else and. And then it, it's so easy, just like when we get into marketing campaigns and everything else, it's so easy to lose sight of why you got involved in this to begin with. And that's the depressing part of it. And yeah. That's what we really have to be careful with. Yeah. And stop being so goddamn greedy. Yeah. That's the thing is that there's something about having fortitude and having integrity, you know, to be able to just have your brand. And, I mean... I try to emulate that the best I can with only taking one event a day mm. because I'm not looking to be... I mean, okay, firstly, uh, it's an incredibly challenging business. Yeah. We took... We got forced into a position last year where we had to take two events in one day and I'll never do it again. It was a uh, clerical was mistake. Times. Well, you, fun you, times. Yeah, you guys did a great job. Mm. And you know, it was challenging. At the end of the day... We made it. We did it. But it's not what I want to do. I'm not in this to make a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, I want to live comfortably. But else, I'm not gonna. I'm not looking to sacrifice the quality. Of yeah, I think it's interesting to just consider our evolution as a species. If we think about that in our day to day life, how does that affect all the concepts that you grapple with running a business? Greed, um, modern modern day business, and how it works. Um, yeah. The expectations of society and modern business. Yeah, and all the strategizing and thinking that takes place there. Um, not to say that any of it is is should be thrown out or shouldn't be considered, because this is what we've become. Like we've become these people who are incredibly intelligent, and we've moved ourselves beyond the survival of. Um, inventing and creating a fire and just being able to survive because of a fire and being and having a meal because we were able to capture an animal all the way up to this point where you and I can sit here it's just so wild man talking into these microphone things and using this form of communication and, and, where and I'm getting trippy right now but that's getting deep yeah, yeah. but also reaching so many people too yeah. and hopefully inspiring folks that's yeah that's the goal. Yeah, And totally. to think that, like, can you imagine as little as, I don't know, what, 25 years ago, 20 years ago? Yeah. This would never be possible. Yeah. Isn't that insane? It yeah. blows my mind that. Yeah. So, so that's the candle lighting, you know? Yeah. And there's the shadow of, the shadow. you know, the manipulation, all the rest of the stuff that comes with it. Yeah, the there might have been. Or whatever else. Yeah. So. I mean, it might have been a shadow being cast when fires were wielded. One I'm sure there was four million years ago. I'm sure there was. I mean, who knows? Like, maybe there were other like Homo erectus species around during that time, and they were like, "Man, that fire is going to be the downfall of Homo erectus." You know? Yeah, it's a classic tale of human nature. We whatever we want, we take. You go to battle. Yeah. You know, and, and so you kill like you are willing to kill. So when it comes to fire, you're now enabled to kill more animals. You're you're enabled to kill higher life forms. When right. before, you know, like there are, there are theories and ideas that it shouldn't be the phrase hunter-gatherer, and that's what we were, should be reversed so that it's gatherer-hunter. Right. And that at first we were around just trying to find food in the form of vegetables and yeah. fruits and roots, and that kind of foraging was happening. And that's where we spent a lot of our time. When we discovered how to had to hunt and kill an animal. It was an amazing uh, efficiency. It was an amazing creation of efficiency and economy. And caloric intake was just so dense and super helpful and great. And that perhaps was candle with a shadow right there too. Because killing perhaps is a shadow to the candle. Yeah, that's a diff yeah it's a difficult conversation. I look forward to digging into that more. Yeah, because again, it's the more you 
as a species grow, the more you have to take to sustain your tribe. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a lot. Going back to Homo erectus about how we talked earlier today about how the extinction of that species came. And a lot of oh, it is yeah. unknown, right? Yeah. A lot of it is unknown. I read unknown. some article, which is the irony behind the article was that they were claiming that Homo erectus was a lazy, lazy species, <laughs> though they were the first ones that left the cradle. Laziness even exists as a concept back then? Uh, I mean, maybe. Maybe that's maybe. Like part of the development of human maybe. is like the ability to become lazy. And it's also kind of scary to think that I mean, let's be honest here. There's a lot of laziness in our culture. And what does that mean? You know? Yeah, what does it mean? Yeah, because there are still some forward-thinking people. But going back to the article was that yeah. the idea was that a Homo erectus ended up becoming lazy. But so then in a the sense that they weren't forward-thinking, they didn't aspire to larger things, which I cannot believe that Maybe to be the Maybe they were just case. playing it safe. But leaving and traveling and trusting That's that you're kind safe. No, it's not. <laughs> like carrying this like Tinder in your pocket into an area that's vastly colder than where you come from yeah. to be able to have faith that you're going to, like, and why you're doing it. Are you doing it to spread or whatever? So, you know, the article said that they were the types of folks that would go and collect stones at the bottom of a hill instead of maybe traveling up to the top of the hill to find something that had a higher amounts of iron to create better tools or something like that. Mm. And ultimately, their downfall was that they were lazy and they were not able to adapt to the change of climate because the area they moved to became more tropical, more rainforesty, and uh, they just they just fizzled out. They didn't know how to handle it, and they just died to do with like <laughs> floods and high heat and everything else. So huh. very strange. But you know, just on that topic too, which I also find is fascinating, is when you're getting into cookery, when you're going out to look for stones, if you guys go out, you'll see certain stones, especially after it rains, you might see a, like a discoloration that looks kind of brown or something like that. Well, that's rust. It means that that stone iron. has a high amount of iron in it. Yeah. So if we were going out to collect it so that we could actually put it into a foundry or smelt it, we'd be on the lookout for those stones and just humping those back to our big kiln that we would bake them in. And what happens at those Trying high temperatures? Yeah, making a pot, making a knife or a pan or whatever. And you're carrying those big stones, who knows how far back. You're baking them, all the minerals fall off, like the limestone and things like that. And you're left with this big mass that you then heat up till it's glowing red and pound it out and create these bricks. And uh, that's also pretty fascinating. As, yeah. as we were talking about earlier, too, like the first... A uh, recorded cast iron piece of uh, cookery oh, yeah. was in yeah. China and back at like 260. Let me see what my notes here say. Uh, 220. 220 AD yeah. in the Han Dynasty. Like, how the hell? How does that even, like, to be able to cast it? Because the art of casting cast iron is incredible, man. Yeah. Yeah. You have to pour that into literally a cast, a, you know, a sand I, cast. Yeah, I know that ancient, ancient Chinese culture, like this is like 3000 BC, Bronze Age. They were dealing with bronze a lot. They started, Which is also fascinating. Yeah. Like, how do they even figure that out? I don't know. So crazy. They started developing these things called dings, which are, were these cooking vessels, uh -huh. which ended up becoming more like sacrificial vessels for sacrificing animals to the gods, sacrificing humans to the gods. Well, all so that what, kind of so stuff. what did it look like? It was basically like a giant pot, like a giant kettle but it would be on, it had legs that came off of it too, sometimes okay. three, sometimes four, and it would just get put into a fire and you could cook on it, in it. In it. Uh, so for a long time it was sacrificially used and then it became, of course, like but a I'm sign of power and I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but like, like I'm assuming with, if the animal was dead. The animal would often be sacrificed and bled out into okay. the... Into the ding. Into the ding. And then was it cooked? Or and then it, it would left? often be cooked, yeah. Okay. It would be fired up and cooked. Interesting. Yeah. And then sometimes they would be allowed to eat it. Sometimes not. But sometimes there were certain people, if you had a particular political or social or noble power, you would be able to eat that after it was prepared Interesting, sort of like the leftovers from the gods. Yeah, they, right. They sort of, they allowed you. Yeah, totally. Very interesting. And then it just became more secular, and it was a common cooking vessel. That's what they used. People would be buried with their dings, because it wow. was like the thing that 
enabled their survival. And can you imagine the work that must have went into actually creating Yeah, I have no idea beautiful. what the process was, but I can't imagine. Like, we, they were no modern foundries or anything like that, no. or even not modern foundries. There were no places where... That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I had the fortune of meeting with a guy, uh, a guy and his wife, actually. Shout out to Butter Pat Industries. Some folks from down south, they came up a few years ago. We went out to dinner. We did some skillet cakes in those. We did, the, yeah, they're very, a very fine cast iron skillet. Beautiful work. He was telling me, I tried to pry to figure out the method because I find that to be fascinating. I mean, we do a little bit of, you know, casting here. Uh, we're still working on it. The thing is, like, we have so many different pardon the pun, irons in the fire, but mm -hmm. we have so many things going on. You don't like that. Sorry. I'll try harder next I'm time. take a nap. Okay. I'll wake you up. Uh, you guys. Again. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we try to do it with, uh, you know, doing some uh, recycled aluminum, melting that down and turning that into pieces of utensils or something like that or cookery. But this guy was trying to get his method and mm -hmm. he wouldn't tell me. It was a very specific blend of sand and whatever else he, he was using. He did say something about like you pour in a layer or something, let it cool and set for like a day or something and then pour in another layer. It was like a layer a day for a certain amount of time. Were you at the dinner? Or... I couldn't remember. No, but okay. I just remember. <laughs> you just remember what? Tell me. I remember you or somebody else in the in the kitchen telling me about that. It's like a it's a very slow process that involved like pouring and waiting. So like that. yeah, so what he would tell me was that it had to do with the grains, the size of the grains in the sand. So he would pour the cast in and. The finer the grain in the sand, the longer it takes to take the product out. Uh, so he said, for him, it's so fine. And to his testimony, like you, we've worked with them, they're incredibly, they're like, they're nonstick. They're incredibly smooth. They're beautiful. And Sean Brock, if you guys know uh, Sean Brock, um, awesome chef, he has a line with them because they, they, they name oh, their really? pans specific things. And one of them oh, has cool. an H based off of Homer. So huh. Sean Brock, it's H. Sean Brock. So Homer is his grandfather's name. Oh, wow. So it's the Homer pot. Not Homer Simpson. Not. Not Homer the philosopher. No. I think like he that. gets, he kind of gets mixed up with Homer Simpson a lot. Yeah. Like that's a big thing. He fights a lot. Sean Brock. No, not at all. <laughs> but uh, I'm so, sorry, Sean Brock, if you're listening right now. No, no, no. Sean's awesome. He's so, just kidding. You're awesome. No, he's a good dude. No doubt. Very, very talented guy. Ambitious, awesome, totally cool. So, yeah. uh, but he was also telling me that Lodge, the, the famous cast iron company, can produce a cast iron pan and get it into the box in one day. Now, you guys know if you get them, they're pretty coarse. You know, not to say that, I mean, I've used Lodge a lot. They're still a very good pan, but there is a difference in quality. So, I mean, if you're looking for something as a family heirloom, totally shout out to Butterpad Industries. Give them, give them a follow, check them out, see what they're doing. They're a great yeah. they're a company. But it's just interesting, the whole process of that. Like yeah. That whole thing. Again, like, just, I, 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 and I find. processes. Yeah, I find. So intriguing, man. Yeah, that whole evolution of the things that we've discovered and the things we've yet to discover are yeah. just so fascinating as yeah. a human species. It's so cool. Yeah, and I, I'm just, as you've been speaking about the creation of that cast iron pan, I was just thinking about the creation of uh, other implements of cooking yep. in that colonial era. Yeah. Um, in North America at that time. They were creating, in essence, what became or what is a cast iron uh, cauldron, but it was made with straw encased in clay. Now, who was making this? These were Native Americans. Put product in or put whatever it is that you want to cook inside of the straw with the clay. Yeah. Encase it, close it shove it in a fire, shove it in a hole of coals, bury it, come back to it in a day, crack it, and make sure that you crack it precisely, by the way, so that you have both of that, both pieces of clay or two pieces of round clay that you can then divide and create two bowls or two more Incredible. cooking vessels. How smart is that? So it's smart, brilliant. but brilliant. like so simple. That's yeah. it. Yeah, right. So now uh, a little shameless plug here, but case for those out there who don't know how to actually get clay, if you uh, look at this little, this little button up on top of here, you'll see I did a video about actually 
getting clay from your own I don't property. See any? I don't uh, see I'll anything. explain it to you. Technology is a crazy thing, bro. So, but it's uh, yeah. check, take a look at that because you could literally be getting clay from your property. Yeah. It literally comes from the soil. There's every bit of soil has a bit of clay in it. And you it's easy to, to identify, it. right? It's it got to be yeah. right. It's a certain color that you're looking for. Sometimes, sometimes not. It's um, like usually after the rain, if there's a puddle and you'll see an area that has a lot of standing water in it. And then a couple of days later, there's a lot of cracks in it. That usually means your soil is very rich in clay. But basically every amount of soil you have, there is a small amount of clay. Now, if you have a really clay rich soil, then you'll be able to refine it pretty quickly. Which is a pain quickly. in the ass if you're trying to start a garden. For sure. Exactly. It's not. So that's the thing is you could re be removing that, making your own homemade pottery, baking stuff in it, whatever. You could also and make like... compost a, into the ground. Yeah. You could make an entire cob oven if you had a large oh, enough hell yeah. crop hell yeah. That's of amazing. that clay, which is ba essentially a similar concept there. Straw mm -hmm. and clay. Yeah. Dome. Earth and oven. Dig out the heat. dome. Like put a hole in the dome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Fill then it with sand, then dig it out after you've made your mold. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. So crazy. Yeah. So and then that'll be another thing too we want to talk about. We'll have to I mean the big thing is I also I want to get in here is have experts in fields, like getting a gardener on here who talks about soil fertility and you know, talking about uh all different kinds of things. I mean yeah. as as you know, as enjoyable as this is. Yeah, screw it's it. a little boy. It, yeah, yeah. No, no, it'll just be it's us, and yeah. you'll like it. But uh, <laughs> you're gonna like it. Yeah, but going back to that too is like hearth cooking and things like that. Back in the colonial area yeah. era, rather, there is uh, a lot of that stuff with, when it comes to baking. Also, an implement that we use, but I've sort of shied away from it because there's so much waste is salt crusted cooking. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, which is an awesome way to cook. You know, and there's all different kinds of ways. I mean, the classic French way. Uh, that I learned before is you're adding just enough salt and water together, and then you would add egg whites, right. but you don't really need the egg whites no. at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, it's actually, it's interesting because you add the egg whites to it, they caramelize because there's protein in there, the mm -hmm. Maillard reaction. And uh, if you just do it straight up, salt and water till it's like basically like a yeah. sand mixture, yeah. you can totally achieve the same thing. And it's bright white like snow and it freaks people out. And they yeah. come up, what is that? They're little kids. Oh, they love it. They're like, is that snow? I said, yes, it's magic snow. <laughs> so, Very salty snow. Yeah. But at the end of the day, is like you could hold on to that maybe. Yeah. And reuse it, but we're talking about for us, it's like 70 pounds of salt. Yeah, it's a lot of salt. It. It's almost extravagant. But it's too much. Yeah, it's definitely a hearkening back in a way or an homage to preservation as a technique that was obviously born out of survival. Uh, and but understanding the use of salt to preserve things is mm -hmm. also something that pushed humans together. Or sure. pushed humans forward, I should say. Yeah, it's big currency. It's a big thing. I mean, yeah, that's it was almost big like currency. an episode all about preservation. I think it's what, what what we should do. Yeah, but and then smoke. you know, there's the classic story about Vikings and that, and they figured out how to salt cod, mm. and that enabled them to store food in giant vats submerged, like cod submerged in giant vats of salt on their ships, so that they can travel and conquer lands. Yeah, they were pretty much badasses, right? <laughs> I mean, those guys did not give a shit. Like, what know, happens if you were oh, a Viking? Oh, this is a nice land you have. Uh, I'm going to take it. <laughs> it's like kind of how it went. Seriously, as the story goes. I wonder what it would be like to be a Viking who was just not hard like that. I think they probably would kill you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, like you just didn't make it. I'm pretty sure that's sort of like in, in essence, sort of like the heirloom fire method is like, oh, well, you can't stand the smoke. I'm going to roll you into the fire and that'll be it. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yeah. happened to many people before. Many people, yeah. Why don't we discuss a yeah. takeaway for today? Let's inspire our, our guests and show okay. them our appreciation for listening in today Yeah. by giving them something that ties up everything we've talked about today yeah. into a beautiful, fiery bow. Yeah, and there's still so much we haven't talked about. A beautiful, but I'm flaming sure will, bow. A beautiful, flaming bow, yeah. But I'm sure that that will come up in other topics. I mean, I think yeah, really what... definitely. The point here is, if you've dabbled in fire cooking, awesome. Push it a little further. What yeah. else can you do? You know, start looking things up. And it does, if you've never done any level of fire cooking, you know, Christ, start a fire 
wrap a potato in a piece of aluminum foil, throw it into the fire, and just feel what that is like. Yeah. I mean, to, to literally be able to create an oven any place you go. Yeah. It's amazing. And understand how simple it is. It's a little difficult at first to understand the mechanics of building a fire, but once a fire is built, let it all hang out, man. Try different things, and you'll see that you get results, and it's not difficult to get good results. Just like you said, throw a potato into the fire. Yeah, but also there's something so beautiful about understanding the fire, to mm. speak the language of fire, mm. You know, to now understand, okay, when I start a fire, I need to use branches, I need to use pine needles, mm. and then I can progressively build up to larger branches or sticks, and Absolutely. then logs, Yeah. and then to understand, okay, well, now I have this fire going back in the old, like, hearth cooking stuff, they would build a tremendously hot fire to and, and build it in progression to understand like, okay, what does your day look like? Okay, so the hottest oven, you want to bake your breads in it. And yeah. then you want to transition down after that to other things like if you're doing a roast or potatoes or then from down there is like custards, uh, yeah. puddings. You know, and then at the end of the night, what they would do is they would put in beans into a crock, put those into the corner because that's your, your coals at the end of the night and they would bank them all up together so that in the morning when they got up, they could restart their fire. Yeah. And if you ran out of coals, it could be a problem sometimes and people would walk up to It's all about the coals, miles. man. Yeah. All about the coals. So that's kind of the situation there is understanding the progression of fire. Yeah. So you really just, uh, you got to get into that part of it enjoy it, you know, then incorporate other things. Like a lot of people will ask about, oh, like when we do these events, oh, what kind of firewood do you use? Mess around different things, get different wood chips, whether it's cherry, apple wood. I love spruce needles, throw those on a fire, you know? Just play, I mean, the important part is here is to, to do it with, do it safely. Yeah. You go into the woods, make sure that the ground, you rake away all pine needles, yeah. and you put a stone perimeter around there. Start a fire, have fun. Yeah, have, have fun. fun. Let it speak to you. Don't burn the f don't 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 burn the forest down. Yeah, don't do that. But also, it's yeah, don't burn the forest down. Forget it. Uh, and also, ta you will find that you tap into an instinct, an understanding. This has happened to me. I just think that it's true. When you get around a fire and you start building a fire and you start cooking with a fire, it feels very natural, man. Yeah. It feels like you, you've known how to do this for a long time and just haven't exercised it for a while. Yeah, it's in our and DNA. It's, yeah, it's That's what literally I'm talking about. The very in beginning, our DNA. The very beginning of this conversation, right? Yep. Out all, it's, it's within us. I love that. I love that. See how we brought that around? Full circle, you know? And that's the other thing, too, is the more you learn to cook with fire, yeah. is a sense of pride. You get to show other people, you get to impress people. It's like, oh my gosh, look at this person, because it's, it's an element. It's a potentially dangerous element, but once you learn how to master it and work with it, yeah. so you know, you know, I, don't, I don't think you ever really master it, because it is in control. Mm. You need to just respect it, yeah. and you learn how to work with it. You come to an agreement, yeah. and uh, yeah, I mean, this, I don't know, something is just, it's so therapeutic. I think, again, it harkens back to this idea that we're going to eat, we're going to survive another day. Yeah. So, yeah. That feels good. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening in. Yeah, thank you again. We really appreciate it. And as always, you know, if you're on Instagram, follow us at Figuratively Feasting. And send us an email at figurativelyfeasting at gmail.com if you have questions, things you want to learn more about. We're happy to uh, talk about things, dig into them a little bit deeper. Yeah, comments, whatever. Yeah, please, yeah, please leave comments, leave questions. We look at all the comments. We're happy to respond to them. So that's Unless you're exciting. being a jerk, we're not going to respond. Well, as we talked about earlier today, when you get the hate, it knows you've made it. So I love that. Yeah, so. That's good. My personal handle is Chef James Gop on Instagram, at Heirloom Fire, at Instagram as well as my business. I am uh, Simeon Food Nature, so I'm at Simeon Food Nature on Instagram and YouTube at the moment. Yeah, excellent. So thank you so much, guys, and we look forward to speaking with you next week. Absolutely. Cheers. <laughs>